Hello, my name is Mr Beasley and this is the third video about Keats's romantic poet Lamia. So far we've looked at the opening 46 lines of the poem and this video will analyse lines 47 to 67. So, quick recap. The god Hermes is in pursuit of a legendarily beautiful nymph but has been unable to find her and instead he's heard a sad voice crying out her desire for a different physical form. Hermes has followed the sound and has discovered a huge snake. And this is Lamia. This section of poetry is a typically Keatsian set piece where the action and movement of the poem stop and Keats displays the real genius of his descriptive powers. It is a description full of rich, colourful imagery, similes, metaphors and also contradictions suggestive of the complexities that lie within Lamia herself. It begins with the metaphor of Lamia's shape being compared to a Gordian knot. Now, this is another piece of mythology, and be prepared for this, because there's quite a bit of mythology within this particular section of poetry. But this one refers to a uh, a puzzle which is impossible to solve. But here, it's more to do with the intricate way in which her snake-like body is wound and curled up. Keats then sets out in fantastic detail the colours on the snake's skin, starting off with the adjective dazzling. Keats then uses a series of similes to compare the patterns on Lamia's skin to other animals. She is striped like a zebra. She's freckled like a pard. Now, a pard is a leopard leopard. And she has eyes like a peacock. But perhaps the most interesting is the way she is depicted as crimson barred. Now, on the one hand, you can read this as simply saying that Lamia's serpentine skin has red lines on it. But remember what I said about line 38 in the previous video. There is a theme of entombment or imprisonment here and bars are another reference to the fact that Lamia is trapped within the body of a snake and longing to get out. There is a wonderful dynamism about the presentation of Lamia's appearance. Her skin is full of silver moons, perhaps another reference to fertility. And as she breathes in and out, the moons dissolve and then brighten again. This could be seen as the first of the contradictions within the description of Lamia. But if it isn't, then the words lustres and gloomier certainly are. Luster meaning radiance or bright light and gloomier meaning dreary or dark. This Next line includes another of these contradictions, rainbow-sided, touched with miseries. So bright and beautiful on the outside, but there is also evidence of sadness. Now, the word penanced in the next line, which is line 55, is interesting because penance is the act of showing sorrow for some wrongdoing, as if Lamia has found herself trapped in the form of a snake because of some transgression committed in the past. Now, you can look these things up, but there are a lot of mythological stories surrounding Lamia, but one of the consistencies between them is that she began life as a beautiful woman who had an affair with Zeus, the king of the Olympian gods, and bore him children. Zeus's wife, Hera, was so enraged by this that she cursed Lamia, forcing her to eat her children. 
and Lamia became disfigured by the horror of what she had done, which is why she exists in the form of a snake. Hera further cursed Lamia by giving her permanent insomnia, the inability to sleep, so that Lamia would never have the ability to, I don't know, switch off from the horror of what she had done. In the myth, Zeus takes pity on Lamia and grants her the ability to remove her eyes, which therefore allows her to sleep. He also gives her the ability to see into the future, which is an idea that Keats develops later on in the poem. I've mentioned contradictions a couple of times in this video so far and there is another on the line that I've just highlighted here which is line 56 where Lamia is described as some demon's mistress or the demon's self. In other words either she has been exploited by some malign supernatural force or she is that malign evil force. Keats then draws our attention to her crest, which is something ornamental on the head of an animal. And remember from line 46 that she is cow shont, which means that she has her snakish head raised. And her crest wore a warnish fire, which is another one of these contradictions. In this case, a proper oxymoron where Wanish means pale and, you know, maybe even unhappiness, while fire is obviously bright, full of life. And also links to the other images of heat in the poem, which, as I've said before, are connected to passion. This crest is further described using the similes sprinkled with stars like Ariadne's tiara, which takes a bit of explaining, so bear with me. OK, in Greek mythology, Ariadne was the daughter of the king of Crete. And in this myth, she meets Theseus, who famously defeated the Minotaur, another mythological creature who lived in a maze labyrinth. Once Theseus had defeated the Minotaur, he needed to find his way out of the maze. And Ariadne helped him to do this using a thread of bright jewels. So you get the idea, the crest on Lamia's head is bright. The next pair of lines create another contradiction in Lamia's appearance. Her head was serpent and yet she had a woman's mouth with all its pearls complete. So presumably a good set of teeth. And this combination of snakish form with desirable human qualities is why we have the oxymoron bittersweet used in line 59 and that I've highlighted here in green. She has beautiful eyes too, although they weep and weep because of the form they currently reside in. Keats uses Another image from classical mythology here as he compares the sadness and loss that Lamia feels to the goddess Proserpine. And again, this takes a little explaining. So, as I said, Proserpine was a mythological goddess, but she was abducted by Pluto, the god of the underworld. And so she weeps, longing to return to her homeland. And this is the comparison that Keats makes, and it ties in again with the theme of imprisonment. Lamia, a beautiful woman trapped, entombed within the form of a snake. The final contradiction in this section concerns the words which Lamia says to Hermes, or at least the way that she says them. Despite her throat being serpent, the words which come from that throat are spoken as though bubbling honey. Another example of the wonderful, sensual nature of Keats' description. For his part, Hermes is sitting and preparing to listen. He lays on his pinions, which are 
feathers. Remember that he has winged sandals, but the bird imagery doesn't stop there and takes a slightly sinister turn as he is compared using a simile to a stooped falcon, a bird of prey ready to strike. With Lamia's sadness, Hermes has spotted an opportunity and the discussion that they have and the deal that they strike is the topic of the next video.